My guest on the podcast today is Myrna Davis, a longtime resident of Sag Harbor who has been uh, active in many areas involving the environment and um, literature and saving Sag Harbor, which is one of the organizations she's part of. And I thought to talk to her about uh, how the area has changed and how she's become so involved in it. Myrna, thank you for being here. And uh, I'll start by asking you a little bit about uh, Save Sag Harbor. When, how long have you been connected with that? And what is it? Well, Save Sag Harbor was founded a number of years before I got involved. And in, in, I think it was 2006 when um, there was the prospect of a CVS coming into the little series of brick built the brick buildings on the corner of uh, Main Street, and there was a group who got together who felt that to maintain the character of the village and preserve independent, family-owned stores, they had to change the code. So that's really how they came into being with a concern for Main Street. And they've been very successful. I mean, Sag Harbor has one of the most appealing, lively Main Streets in the area. And I was- um, you've, lived here, you've lived here, what, since the 70s, I guess? Well, we, we moved out here. We bought our house in 66. <laughs> <laughs> and, <laughs> On a, we were the only people who even saw it. it was, there was an ad in the paper on a Thursday and we bought it on a Friday night. I, re, I remember that there were a lot of abandoned old historic houses in, in Sag Harbor. It was sad to see. They were run down. I wouldn't say abandoned. It was a, a year round working class town. There were five working factories at that time in the village. Which, which were they? Bulova on the wharf, the watch case factory, um, or not Bulova, I mean, the Bulova was the watch case factory, it was Grumman on the wharf. Right. Sag Harbor Industries, where Dr. Oppenheim is now on, on Bay Street, um, another one on Germain yep. Avenue, and then Rowe Industries, just uh, on the edge of the village going out on uh, the turnpike. I remember rowdy bars in town. Sandpiper was- I think there were 11. <laughs> <laughs> you walk down the street and some guy, some drunk gets thrown out on the road right out in front of you. Well, we came out the summer after we were married. We rent, I, I came out ahead and um, I saw an ad in the paper and I rented a house in North Haven, just over the bridge, the second house that belonged to a family named Hodenpile. It was a simple farmhouse. And we, Paul and I both fell in love with the village. We, it felt like, you know, a throwback in time. And we looked at a few houses. I didn't know, Paul was from Oklahoma and everywhere we went, he, he would say, we should buy a house here, but we were newlyweds, I didn't know. <laughs> Anyway, we came out with Tommy Unger that October for a weekend. And again, the day before I saw this house listed. So we came and looked at it and bought it. And I liked that at least it was in a village and I could walk to things because I was such a New Yorker. And I had no idea what life in a small town was like. It was a revelation. <laughs> I'll bet you you paid either four or five figures for that house. Oh, yes. Um, 15,000, it's a good guess. 23, our neighbors, <laughs> we paid much. Oh. <laughs> what, what um, the, all the industries have left and the, the uh, village continued on and it's, Historic state really from the 1940s and 19, early 50s with the local stores and everything. And how is uh, Save Sag Harbor, uh, how has it been able to keep things like CVS or um, 
uh, other chains from coming in? What's the well, zone? There are, there are some small chains, but the, um, the code has certain requirements that um, size limitation, um, requirements for, I, th I think at that time, maybe housing on a second floor, although that didn't affect that building, um, that signage and other decisions like that had to be, could not be made from a distant central place, but had to be local. Um, I mean, it, the consolidation of everything is challenging, you know. Um, since you first got here, uh, don't name them all, but what organizations have you joined to try and help Sag Harbor make it into the future or the environment or you've been involved in quite a bit? Well, as I said, I was an accidental activist in some way. Um, I think the... Probably, how, do you, how do you mean that? How do you mean that? Well, I mean, when, I, when we, we decided to live here um, full time in 1968, we'd had a child. Our apartment was, um, we needed to, to find a bigger apartment. Paul was having a show in Paris. We put everything into the house and went to Europe for a few months and then came back. And um, I was walking, I had a baby carriage because I was a New Yorker and I was walking the baby carriage down to Massachusetts Park. And Nancy Willie came out of her house, which is now the Historical Society one day. And she said, how do you do? I'm Nancy Willie and I'd like to know who you are because I've seen you walk by the house every day now for a week. <laughs> and I suddenly realized how visible you were in a small town. I was living here as if I was living in New York. I don't know you, you don't know me, you know, just <laughs> a few years, I guess a year or two after that, she founded the Sag Harbor Preservation Commission when it became possible to landmark, make a village a, la a national landmark. That was her ambition. And she drafted me, Jean Futterman, the architect, Robert Pine, the planner, Joe Markowski, who's a local guy and knew a lot about history, and um, one or two others. And I knew nothing about preservation, but I was honored to be asked and um, happy to be involved. And so, you know, we achieved that. We achieved landmark status for the village in the early 70s. So that, I suppose, was the beginning. I learned a lot during that period. Um, I got very involved in the Hampton Day School and was on the search and, and that I was involved in that too, almost by accident because our son was in a play group at the Topping Horse Farm and the teacher didn't come back the second year. And so Tinka Topping arranged for all these little children to go to the day school and then I wrote, then I got invited to be on the benefit committee. Helen Rattray had had an idea for a potato cookbook and I ended up doing the potato book. Yeah, it's quite famous, that book. That book, the parents published it. Uh, four of us put up $400 each and had it printed at the printer on Main Street in Bridgehampton. Truman Capote wrote an introduction. He was a fan of the school. And I got 23 artists to do drawings. And it was picked up by William Morrow. And as a hardcover, and the, and the editor, uh, Narcisse Chamberlain said, if you had come to me with this idea, I never would have done it. It sounds so boring, but it's such a charming book. It went into four languages, oh paperback, one of the languages was Japanese. It recently was reissued in Japanese a couple of years ago. <laughs> it just, oh, and the, and the foreword was taken without permission and is in, except for the last two lines about the day school, Truman Capote's foreword was 
in the big red book of the Hamptons. <laughs> so that it just has had a life of its own. Anyway, then I was involved in the search committee and so forth. Um, what else? What other activism? What, uh, where do you think Sag Harbor sits right now in terms of looking at its future and how it might change or not? Well, I think it's at a very critical point. In, in many ways, being um, economically depressed preserved it. I mean, Sag Harbor was not um, a popular destination except on a rainy day to go antiquing or for drinking. And, you know, when we bought our house, people said, I never met anyone who lived in Sag Harbor. <laughs> they lived in East Hampton. Um, it was considered, you know, kind of a rough working class town, but it was beautiful to me always. I mean, it was a treasure trove of architecture and even a little rundown. I mean, it was, the history was great. So, you know, I think in the, in the 80s, late 80s, 90s, it began to be restored, but now it's being transformed, which could really destroy its historical scale and character. And uh, it's a tough fight because it's a very charming village still. It has an amazing harbor, a little main street that ends, you know, with the harbor, not uh, interrupted by a highway. And um, people want to be here, but they want to make big houses out of tiny houses. And it's um, hard to persuade people in this time that it's worth keeping the character of these houses. So I don't know what's going to happen. You know, we're doing our best. What are some of the things that uh, you're doing to try and keep that thought in the minds of the buyers? Well, I think we need to do more education. I think that, um, you know, boards change, the commitments, um, you have to educate people about the value of what's here. Realtors have to understand that there are about 830 what are called contributing houses in the village that are not historical landmarks in and of themselves, but contribute to the historic nature of the village. And so if each one is taken on its own, it can be death by a thousand cuts, you know, that you yeah. just lose that. Um, but they've managed to do it in certain places like um, Martha's Vineyard and Nantucket. But yeah. it, it takes education and commitment, you know, for everybody to understand that the values actually go up rather than down when you preserve it. What, uh, what, is, what have you seen done on the, uh, those two islands? that might be helpful for say Harvard. Well, we, we showed a film, there was a very good film and we, um, there are copies now at the library to borrow um, called One Big, uh, One Big Home, which was made over a period of about a dozen years uh, by a young filmmaker who was horrified by the size of the houses going up in Nantucket. And it, it deals with every kind of voice, you know, the architects, the wealthy people, the locals who work and had jobs because of, you know, the construction, the boards. And in the end, it just got too much. And they did decide that they had to put limits. I mean, some of those houses were, um, looked like motels, you know, <laughs> every, window facing the water. And um, one big home also meant we live on a planet, you know, it's one big home and we have obligations. And I think um, providing materials to realtors, to board members as they change, um, to help the understanding and appreciation of old things. Cause I had none either. I mean, I had no idea. Um, it's not just about you don't want to have a town preserved 
in aspic um, and control every little detail so that it looks unreal. But, you know, uh, the other thing is to keep the middle class in all of these towns because that's what creates a year round population and a year round life. So um, it's, it's challenging. Mary Hemming was one of our first friends. She owned the house that now um, Christy Brinkley owns, the large house over the bridge. And they bought their house. I think they moved out here in the 50s. And she said, don't tell anyone about Sack Harbor. She <laughs> felt it was a well-kept secret. Yeah. And it was, you know, it, it has a magic that Jimmy Ernst talked about the East End as having a, a sense of place that has nothing to do with anything you, you intend. It just draws you here. And I think a lot of us understand that. I, uh, do, do you have the experience of being able to walk from one end of Main Street down to the other end and have people stop you and talk to you? Oh, yes, still. Yes. Yeah, I mean, it's hard to go out and even just go to the post office and back without mm -hmm. seeing two or three or people. Um, Do you have that? I mean, is that true? You know, I remember a time when on the turnpike going to Bridgehampton, uh, facing cars going towards Sag Harbor, there was a sign on the right-hand side of the road that it said, um, Sag Harbor, um, and then under it, it said, visit our whaling museum. And in the fall, uh, every year, they would take the, the whaling museum would close down. And so they put a sign under Sag Harbor that just said the word closed. <laughs> it, read, it read, Sag Harbor closed. <laughs> And I, I, I just was thinking about I, I wish I had taken a picture of that. That was how it was back then. Um, I don't know when you started your paper, but I seem to have a memory that we visited Montauk and picked up a paper in front of White's. You did. And, and read it as if it was all true at first. <laughs> Well, we, the paper started in 1960. Uh, I moved out here in 56, 57 as a- Oh, you've seen it all. Teenager, my parents moved us out here. So I've, I've seen some of the changes. Make a, tell me a list of particular places and things to do in Sag Harbor that you enjoy today. Oh, I think- um... The, the newest, of course, is the church, which is amazing. Uh, Errol, Eric Fischel and April Gornick's transformation of the old Methodist church, which is a landmark. And um, it is. It's a very large, large building also. I want to tell you something that um, there are a few doors down from there, uh, going toward town, is Il Cappuccino, which... Uh, yes. This is an Italian restaurant with uh, wine bottles hanging from the ceiling and so forth and so on. But the door to it is on the side. It's on the uh, side of the building, which is in the alley. And I found out why that was. There was a law on the books, it's probably still there in Safe Harbor that says, you cannot serve liquor within 50 feet of a church. <laughs> and if you pace it off, even there was a long period of time when the church was uh, um, out of bounds, it wasn't even the church anymore, uh, but it looked like one, it certainly still does today. But if you paced it off, it was 50, 48 feet to the side wall. So you could have an entrance to the restaurant on the alley, but you couldn't have it facing the street. And that's why that is. Well. There's a bigger story connected to that. Which is what? Before it was an Italian restaurant, it was a vintage clothing store owned by a fellow named Anthony. 
and we used to hang out. I mean, I love talking to him. I bought some wonderful, you know, 30s beaded dresses and things. <laughs> and he got bored with running a shop. And so he decided to open a restaurant. And he put, you know, checkered tablecloths and Chianti bottles with multicolor <laughs> candle strippings. And um, there were some residents of a house that backed onto that, uh, that on Main Street next to Corcoran, a mansard roof house. It was painted yellow at the time. And these women objected to the cooking smells and they brought a suit against him because he was too close to the church to yes. serve alcohol. <laughs> but at the same time, there was a suit against, to my understanding, against uh, Rowe, Robert Rowe, who had built the condos that are down on Bridge Street because they didn't conform to the residential code and the village, I think there were people from the village involved in some way or anyway, Anthony had a lawyer that discovered that the village had not filed a paper and declared their entire code invalid. And someone told me that if they had gone to court, a judge would have allowed the village to file the paper rather than have no zoning. Yes. But the village, uh, realize, I guess, that the other suit would have no merit either. Anyway, there was no zoning in the village for one year, at which time the house on Otter Pond became a restaurant. Yep. People across the street from me built to the very edge of their property at Cross and Rector Street, so you really can't see around the corner <laughs> and makes a very tight turn there. Um, People just did whatever they wanted for a really? year. <laughs> what year was that? You said? I think it was 1970. My goodness. And so then Anthony, you know, but he continued to run the restaurant and then eventually sold it. And then it became Il Cappuccino. Yep. So um, it was a kind of Wild West scene in those early days. Well, there was the black buoy and the sandbar and a whole bunch of others. The argon. <laughs> there is a, a vestige in town of that whole era, which is continuing to this day. What is? The noon whistle. Yes, the factory whistle. <laughs> right. <laughs> Time <laughs> for lunch. Yeah. And they still have it. Yeah. Well, it's been wonderful talking to you about Sag Harbor, these and I want to thank you for coming on the podcast, Mrs. Myrna Davis, and uh, I'll see you on Main Street. Thank you, Dan. Look forward. Okay. Bye-bye.